All right, good afternoon. What I want to do now is go over chapter 40. If you have any questions, please feel free to email them to me. I understand this is a little different than we've been doing it, but uh, circumstances as I already discussed are what they are. I think this should work well. Uh, please email me any questions. I will try my best to answer them and get back to you as quickly as possible. And so there you go. All right, so chapter 40 deals with management resuscitation of the critical patient, but is who is the critical patient? What are we talking about here? We're talking about people in the pre-arrest or already in cardiac arrest and uh, or suffering from significant shock and things like that that we're trying to keep them from going into cardiac arrest. So what is our focus? Well, I think that should go without saying right there. <sighs> And I think the focus should be on our rapid assessment. So, right, use the time appropriately, make a wise decision, provide care an appropriate amount of time. I don't think it should be pretty straightforward. So, how do we make good decisions? Where does excellent decision making come from? Well, experience is truly the only way to have to develop that intuition, that ability to make a great decision really quickly because you can be book smart, you can be knowledgeable on the topic at hand, but without experience with patients, without time in the field to see how things progress, you may not realize that what you read about and learned about is what is presenting to you in this moment. And it's with that experience that you can walk in the door, look at your patient, be like, yeah, this is not going to go well. This is this patient's already in a really bad situation or something like that. So that's where experience comes in. Does education, is in education important? Absolutely. Does being book smart help you? Yes. But book smarts without practical application of that experience, whether it's from the assessment side or from the uh, intervention decision-making side, it's just that book knowledge is not useful. All right, who are our critical patients? Where will we find them? Well, we're going to find them in quite a number of areas. Now, typically, the more significant conditions, as you can see here, are going to be recognized in the unhealthy patients. So we'll already have warning signs that this person is going to have a problem or more likely to be critical. We don't often see major heart failure, uh, coronary artery disease, heart attacks, strokes, and things like that in the healthy adult. Drug toxicity electrolytes, as you can see here, uh, PEs, these are all very common or very possible in a healthy adult. They do not require a lot of comorbidities. But for the rest of these, we typically have other comorbidities and obvious signs and long-term issues before we get to this critical state. That is not to say it can't happen. A person can have a sudden cardiac arrest. A person can have a sudden stroke. You might not expect a stroke um, if you're dispatched to a residence for a 15-year-old patient who is complaining of numbness and weakness on one side of their body. Probably not thinking stroke, but it is possible. It can happen. So, in the presence of comorbidities and other conditions, will often make their overarching uh, issue or the fact that they can get into the critical stage quicker a consideration. So we want to look for that. Now, I don't know if anybody out of uh, happens to know what this piece of equipment is in this uh, image here. That is a mechanical CPR device. It mounts to the side of the stretcher with a big clamp and then has that control rod that's, or that control arm that slides down the vertical pole and there's a piston inside that uh, contraption that extends over the patient's chest and does compressions. You can see the airline attached to it. This is a pneumatic powered system. And if you're familiar with the back of the ambulance, you know your only source of compressed air is O2 cylinders. So this thing burns through O2 cylinders like nobody's business. So um, this is your third man in a box. It, for those of you that work with fire departments and such like that, uh, this is a precursor to the auto pulse, which, as you know, is the precursor to the 
Lucas device. Obviously, these devices are not associated with each other, they're not the same companies or anything like that. That's not what I'm saying. However, this is a early uh, or an older mechanical CPR device in that image. All right, so how do we handle critical decisions? How do we handle critical patients? Well, we use this method where we're ultimately getting to the target. What is our goal? What, you know, what is the deal going on here with this patient? So, you know, perform your scene size up. What are the circumstances? What are you seeing on the scene? What are indicators? You know, or do you see drug paraphernalia? Do you see medical equipment? Do you see stacks and stacks of boxes full of three liter normal saline solution? That would indicate the patient is probably on peritoneal dialysis. That's one of the reasons you would keep that much material. Are there vents in the home? Are there a lot of medical equipment? These should all clue us into existing medical conditions that will complicate our current situation and make it more likely that the patient will end up in a critical case much quicker than a non um a patient who doesn't have chronic medical conditions. All right, so after doing that scene size up, you're walked to the door, you're entering the room, you're doing your primary surveys on the patient, you're actually looking at airway breathing circulation. Now remember, we can't truly correct problems that we see in these because we're not fixing them in the long term. But what we can do is intervene. If their airway is closed, we can intervene and open it. If they're not breathing adequately, we can intervene and improve that breathing. Same with circulation and so on and so forth. Um, with mental status, we can intervene on possible causes, but we can't, we normally don't have definitive care. What well, we, we really don't. So I like to say we intervene versus correcting. Now, You've done that, you've moved on to your secondary survey, you're getting your history, you're getting your vital signs, you're getting your um, EKGs, you're doing all of your diagnostics. So it's a combination of both subjective and objective, but these are for the non-life threats, you know, the, anything not A, B, C, D. Now, the chart here shows us that we are going to consider what is the most likely cause of this problem at this point. Honestly, I'm considering that from the moment of dispatch. So I'm doing my scene size up, my primary, my secondary. I'm already making a list of what could be causing this. If somebody, if I get dispatched for a cardiac, not a cardiac arrest, but chest pain, you know, I'm thinking, I'm making a list. What is, what causes chest pain and what will kill you the fastest? Which of those kills you the fastest? So I'm going to put MI very high on the list. Pneumothorax, pericarditis, pneumonia, um, gallbladder attack, pancreatitis, uh, esophageal reflux disease, um, starting to get out of order here, less, you know, my severities getting mixed up, costochondritis, a pulled muscle, a fractured rib, a fractured um, man, not mandible, uh, sternum, um, such like that. And we're going to go down that list and how can we rule this out? Well, if we're responding to a medical complaint with no history of trauma, then it's probably not a fractured rib or fractured sternum. It could still be a pneumothorax. Those can be spontaneous um, and not trauma or induced. So I'm, I walk in, I do my scene size up. I note that I'm in a residence with an elderly patient who is probably not been up and moving around and lifting. So we probably aren't dealing with a pulled muscle. However, a fractured rib from a fall could still be a problem or a possibility. Um, so I'm ruling things out. You know, what is my possibility here? Could be a pneumothorax. If the patient has a history of COPD and they were coughing, they popped a spontaneous pneumo. It happens. Um, all right, so we've kind of started ruling that out and then I moved into my secondary survey. Well, an MI is something that it causes chest pain and can kill you really quick. It's also really easy to rule out. We're on a 12 lead. Oh, look, 12 lead's good. No problems here. So, problem not 12 lead. Let's move on to the next thing. You know, have they eaten recently? Have they ever had this before? And we go through all of our secondary assessment there. So really my consideration of the most serious condition starts as at my dispatch, all right? And then I use all of my objective and subjective data to narrow it down to a short list, one, two, or three. Generally, I'm looking at it being one of two or three different options. And 
then I'm going to start treating the mo the one I think is most likely. And that could mean, oh, I think that this is asthma. So I'm going to give the patient albuterol and I'm going to listen to their lung sounds to see that it improves. Because if the treatment that I gave does not result in any change or improvement, it is possible that I misdiagnosed, that I have missed a sign, a symptom of some sort, and I have the wrong field diagnosis. So I'm constantly going to be revisiting that field diagnosis and let's intervene and so on and so forth. Another example, we are looking at a patient with chest pain. I ran my 12 lead. I said it's not an MI because they don't have ST changes. They don't have depression. They don't have elevation. Right? So we know it's not an MI, but does that mean it can't be angina? No, it could still be angina. You may not have ST changes during an angina situation, whether it's stable or unstable. Unstable is more likely to have it. Anyway, we run the 12 lead. There's no ST changes. It could be angina. Not being able, can't identify any other cause, uh, doesn't, you know, that's still pretty high on my list. Well, if it was angina, or I would think there's a possibility this is coronary artery disease or um, acute coronary syndrome, ACS, or something along those lines, well, treatment would be aspirin and nitro. I don't really expect to see any physiologic or complaint presentation change from the patient if the condition is uh, acute coronary syndrome, uh, for, excuse me, from the aspirin specifically. Aspirin is not really going to change the pain. It works more, uh, we're giving it for platelets, not pain. But if I go ahead and give my patient nitro, and this is angina, I would anticipate that the nitro would relieve the chest pain, that the nitro would relieve the condition. So did it work? Reassess them. Did their pain improve even a little bit? That would indicate that it is at least somewhat related to the angina. If after giving the nitro, there was no change in the patient's chest pain complaint, now they're complaining a headache or dizziness or something else or because their blood pressure's gotten low, well, I know that this is not angina. Well, at least I have a really good indication that it's probably not angina because it's not responding to nitroglycerin. This is assuming I gave the nitroglycerin appropriately, that it is not expired or in, uh, inert due to improper uh, storage practices or something along those lines. There's very, there's always variables, but I'm leaning towards angina is not the cause here. So now that I have my short list, I'm trying to do my treatments. I'm going to choose to transport to the uh, most appropriate facility. Obviously, transport and treatment are going to uh, go hand in hand and may take turns as to which one has priority. If the patient's in critical condition, if they're in, um, you're having problems to any of your primary survey, A, B, C, D, E, well, then you're going to need to transport prior to treatment. Otherwise, you may do treatments and interventions in the field prior to transport. All right, so I've provided transport to the appropriate facility and I've reassessed to make to see if my interventions made any difference or did what I was expecting them to do. And now with that information, I can take that list of two or three options. I can either expand it to some new, ruling out some, or I can narrow it down to like, it's one of these two and I really think it's this. And generally, we can get a really good idea. Again, we do not diagnose, but we can identify the likelihood of a specific condition happening with that patient at that time. So. Another crazy acronym. I'm not really recommending that you uh, try to memorize this one. Uh, in my opinion, it it isn't really helpful because I mean, whether you use AEIOU tips or MT ship or um, whatever else, you know, tr it's just a matter of trying to remember what causes altered mental status. Um, especially when you throw so many things under H there, both hypos and hypers, I th feel like it just it gets muddy. But um, consider your population, consider your surroundings. Uh, alter, sudden unexplained altered mental status in younger patients is very commonly associated with medication problems. Um, a gradual or even somewhat sudden um, progression of altered mental status in the elderly, in the bedridden, or in the medical uh, patients in medical environments 
I would be looking for sepsis. I would be looking for a UTI, especially in women or men who have to use some, of some kind of incontinent help or are having to cath themselves in various ways. UTIs are a very common cause of your altered mental status. Psychiatric or behavioral disorders are another great example or another common, I shouldn't say great, but they're another common example. Um, the other day, I ran a call for a patient who, where we were dispatched for a complaint of uh, allergic reaction was what the condition call went out as. Um, patient was reportedly unresponsive and uh, not breathing well. So we're thinking either this is something that's not an allergic reaction or this is a really bad allergic reaction already. Uh, I was very close to the scene and uh, had a very short response time. Patient was supine, flaccid, breathing, but not very well, and had a mouthful of saliva and fluid. I rolled the patient over, suctioned the airway, and the patient was breath actually breathing quite adequately. Had a good heart rate, had a good O2 set. And I'm like, all right, she's not responding to pain. Like, and I'm talking, a, you know, pain, pain, and um, not getting any response there whatsoever. All right, so she's... Something's going on here. Still remaining flaccid, not moving her extremities appropriately. Turns out she has a condition that's called Chiari syndrome, or excuse me, Chiari malformation, which means that a portion of her cerebellum and brainstem have protruded through the foramen magnum in her skull and into the spinal column cavity, where the spinal cord is supposed to be. This result is in episodic paralysis, essentially, to her extremities, complete flaccidity in the extremities, although she's still able to breathe. Um, I don't fully understand everything, but I do understand how the cerebellum works with our postural uh, posture and our, you know, as our athlete's brain and you know, the gross motor function and control of our extremities. So, if that's where your problem is and it's not a brainstem problem and it's not an entire neuromuscular issue like uh, like with your acetylcholine function, then it would make sense that just the extremities would be affected and not the diaphragm, which is a skeletal muscle, but is innervated differently than the extremities. So she is completely unresponsive, but her eyes are open. Her pupils are not pinpoint. She is not showing hives. She does not have wheezing or laryngeal edema or uh, laryngeal swelling of any type. There is no angioedema. There is no rash or uh, urticaria. There, so we're ruling out a lot of the things that we would look for for anaphylaxis. So I'm looking at her. I'm saying, well, it's not anaphylaxis because she doesn't have those symptoms. Blood pressure was good, the whole nine yards. But something was definitely off. Um... Probably not opioids because her pupils were not pinpoint and her respiratory status was adequate. So we don't think it's a, opioids. Could it be benzos? True, it could be benzos. Uh, could have been a seizure. Whether that was a absence seizure, a partial seizure, you know, complex partial seizures will do that where there's altered mental status associated with it, but they don't have tonic-clonic movement. Um, it could be even a pseudo seizure. I have seen quite a number of pseudo seizures and it really didn't present as a pseudo seizure to me. Um, now the, um, so that was an option, not really seeing it. We checked her blood sugar, blood sugar was good. So we knew it wasn't hypoglyce, hypo or hyperglycemia. Temperatures were fine. So it wasn't th hypothermia. O2 sats were good. Lung sounds were clear. So it wasn't hypoxia. She didn't fit the category. She was like 20 somethings. And so she really didn't fit the category for being at high risk of a UTI. Patients at that age range tend to know when they have a UTI and it doesn't progress rapidly into a sepsis state. Uh, could it have been a psychiatric or behavioral disorder of some sort? It could very well be. Patients will go catatonic in a sense. Um, they can have those um, lights are on nobody's home moments could be in that case. So my options at this point, I had no idea at that moment what a Chiari malformation was. 
patient's mother is telling me it she's explaining that she that it tends to be activated by various allergies in her allergy list environmental food and medication was extensive uh one thing that made me think that this might actually be uh more legit than certain people were thinking was her preferred treatment is decadron and uh diphenhydramine now had they said something along the lines of dilated in fenugrin to fix this allergic reaction i'd be like well that's a unique condition considering neither one of those are really used for allergic reactions typically fenugrin can be it has a role but um with h2 receptors but not typically used for that but when they're like yeah diphenhydramine and decadron so is this like the opposite of a dystonic reaction dystonias tend to cause muscle cramping and muscle contractions and all that generally localized as a reaction to medications this could happen like to a medication like a benzo your allergic reactions to a benzo may present as a dystonic reaction whereas your allergic reactions to a um ACE inhibitor could result in angioedema, swelling in the tongue and mouth, versus laryngeal edema or something like that. So there's so allergic reactions present in different ways. So they, well, it's kind of interesting. The EMS crew arrives and they start loading the patient up, and the paramedic was of the opinion this was not a um, allergic reaction; that this was very much a faking episode. That she was did not want to take the patient serious they're transporting the patient out to the ambulance we're on a third floor apartment so you know how that goes well i start looking it up chiari malformation turns out the listed symptoms of chiari malformation is where i got the info what is it and all that are identical to what the patient is presenting with okay i ain't no doctor not making no differential diagnoses here or no diagnosis but her presentation matches the symptoms associated with the condition that her mother says she has. So, um, I'm like, yeah, probably a problem here. Probably what's going on. So I mentioned that to the medic and yada, yada, yada. Well, what happened after that is irrelevant to this story, but the point is there's a number of different things that can cause altered mental status, and we don't always know it. Could it be psychiatric? But jumping to psychiatric before ruling out all other possibilities is very dangerous and could result in write-ups. All right, so let's say here's, I, and I've kind of already looked, I've already brought this up to an extent. What are our differential diagnosis for chest pain? How do we identify, you know, patient says they have chest pain. These are our causes. These are things that could cause the problem. Ischemic chest pain. Well, does it relieve with nitro? Do they have ST changes on their 12 lead? GI symptom causes. How is this associated with the, their food? Does it happen after eating? Does it happen when they haven't eaten for a long period of time? How does the pain compare? Musculoskeletal. Does it hurt worse when they pull, uh, move their arm, when they uh, touch it, when they take a deep breath or something? Is it respiratory? Do they have abnormal lung sounds, cough, or something along those lines? Is this a panic attack? Are all other symptoms obviously not present and leading us to believe that this is a panic attack? Shingles. Shingles is going to be a horrible pain in the chest, but it's going to follow a myoderm. Um, or excuse me, I should say dermatome. It's going to follow the nerve track through from wherever spinal nerve that it is uh, wrapping around the chest and the rash will present along that uh, dermatome. So, yeah, it's an easy thing to rule out. Cancer in the chest, generally our patients know that, but there's always the possibility that we're responding to chest pain and they've got a giant tumor in their chest that they weren't familiar with. Typically, cancer patients are going to have um, other symptoms first that clue them in and take them to the doctor's so, generally isn't one that's going to jump out and surprise us so all right we've talked about uh intuition this is kind of the 
A lot of literature is going to teach you to look at your patient, do your assessment, and determine is this patient sick or not sick? Well, sick or not sick is a great determination, but I like to add the third one, not yet sick. And intuition is what will point that out for us. Not yet sick is a not sick patient who has the signs and symptoms of a significant condition that is going to rapidly progress into a more concerning or more critical state. And so we don't want to um, rule that out, that possibility out. All right, so here's one of the big concerns with intuition though. Just because you've seen this before and treated it X doesn't mean you were right. Try to follow up. And it's one of the things every time I have a unique situation, a really critical patient or something abnormal or out of the ordinary, I try my best to get follow up on that patient. That is very difficult with HIPAA. It requires a lot of good relationships with staff and such at the hospital who recognize that what you're doing is for educational purposes and this is not a curiosity or a HIPAA violation. Remember, medical information can be shared and released and used for education and quality control purposes. But in order for that to happen, it almost always, well, I shouldn't say almost always, it should follow very specific guidelines very specific requirements. So don't use information gained by making mistakes to guide future decisions, decision making. All right, so um, here's one, you know, in uh, talking a little about intuition. Here's what I think we're dealing with. Here's what I think we should do. This is why. Here is what we should keep our eyes on. And are there any other concerns? This idea, is, this conversation is one that you would have with both yourself and with your partner or any other crew members on scene who are helping in the treatment process to try to discuss what is it we're dealing with? What do we think we have? And are we doing the right thing? This five question checklist is a great way to really narrow down our thoughts. You know, here's what I think we have going on. And this is what I think we should do with it. And this is why. And I honestly think that question number three and question number four are two of the most important questions on this list. Obviously, we have to know what it is we think that's going on and how we're going to treat it. But do we have a why? Can we explain why we think that's going on? And do we understand the process enough to know what things could change? If it is X, what are the progressions of that? What do we expect to see happen? Or if we intervene, what do we expect to see happen? But also, if we think that it, we're going with X, but it's a possibility of Y, which one, what do we would, bleh, what would we expect to see change if it was Y and not X in the first place. And then open yourself up for constructive criticism and feedback. Are there any other concerns? Is there anything about this patient that I missed? And I'll be first to admit that happens frequently. You've tunnel vision, we'll talk about that in a minute, but you've tunnel vision, you've caught a whole bunch of information People, multiple people are feeding you data and you think, this is what it's going on. And you're like, all right, this is what I'm doing. And then they're all looking at you cross-eyed and they're like, they're like, what? Did you not see the needle fall out of their arm? Oh, no, I didn't. Okay. So there you go. I mean, that's a dumb, obviously, I would hope you would see that. But it's like, oh, no, family member says they have a history of aneurysms. Oh, okay. So now we're thinking aneurysm, not, you know, whatever. So having those eyes, um, extra eyes on scene and information, you know, that feedback is very, very useful. Now, biases. Bias gets us in trouble all the time. And I'm not talking about the type of bias that is all over the news media and social media these days. I'm talking about confirmation and anchoring bias, which is actually those kind of are in another way, but I wasn't even going to go there. But anyway. Confirmation bias. What is that? If I dispatch you to the residence for a 22-year-old female complaining of chest pain, a confirmation bias would say there is no way that this patient is having an MI. 
That is just not possible. She must be having a panic attack. Now, I understand that that could be taken as I've just, you know, stereotyped and all these other things and made these assumptions and that's very possible but that's the point that's what confirmation bias does it tells you i don't think there's anything possibly significant here it must be insignificant so you are now going to gather bias or you're going to gather information that supports your perspective um to Take a risk at entering one of the more recent uh, hot button topics of the time. If you do not believe a medication such as a vaccine works, then you are going to read and interpret all further data on that perspective from that perspective and think this confirms or denies. And you're going to ignore things that argue or take a different per approach. The same goes the other way. If you are convinced that vaccines are work and are effective and they are good and we need to use them, then you're only going to find data that supports that perspective. Now, this plays very closely to the concept of anchoring bias. Confirmation bias is the use of information or disuse or, or um, it is the recognition or ignoring of, or it's acceptance or ignoring information based on whether it confirms what you were looking for. So if I walk in on a house for, on a call for chest pain with a 22 year old female, I'm going to ignore the fact that she is sweating and focus on the idea, well, she's breathing fast, so therefore it must be a panic attack. You see what I'm saying? That's a confirmation bias. I've, I'm ignoring information. I'm only looking at the symptoms that are um consistent with what i think is going on you know i'll ignore that she's having radiating pain and uh recognize that she's got a good o2 sat or something like that that's confirmation bias now the anchoring bias is the issue where literally back to the argument about vaccines if you don't think the vaccine will work it's very hard for you to find information or interpret information that says it will if you think it will work it's very hard for you to find information that says maybe it's not the right thing to do or maybe it's not healthy. And um, unfortunately, people get so stuck in their confirmation biases or their anchoring biases that when they're um, – they're, they will attack other people's perspectives. So I've seen this on EMS – Boom. The call I was talking about a minute ago with this chick, the paramedic that responded to the scene, he was of the opinion that this patient was faking it. And so he was continuing to interpret information that would help him. He was doing specific tests and evaluations to try to identify that and rule it out. Um, and he, but he was, I don't know if it was on purpose or if it was subconscious, but he was subconsciously performing the tests in less than perfect conditions that gave the information that or the answer he wanted he also ignored the fact that if the patient had this condition that we we're talking about that causes extremity paralysis oh well she can move her mouth she she smiled therefore she must be faking it well actually the condition doesn't affect cranial nerves it only can um, affects this extremity. So, you know, that's where the confirmation and anchoring bias will uh, distort the view. So it is incredibly important for you to learn to recognize the biases that you have. You have biases, whether you like it or not, you have them. When we get dispatched to a call, those biases will be present and we need to um, be aware of those, discuss those in our after action report with our partner, watch out for them in the future and avoid them. It takes actions to avoid them. And you know, the cool thing is if you hear your partner say something like, oh, I'm pretty sure it's got to be this or whatever, you can recognize there that they're either have a confirmation or an anchoring or both, that they have both of those. And in that event, when you get on scene, you need to be thinking, well, let's be aware of this. Let's look for other things. I know that I have this bias, so I'm going to make certain to bring up points that are 
easily ignored, all right? Yes, you're right. These things, A, B, and C, are all present, indicating that you think it's X. However, you missed D, E, and F, which, when combined with A, B, and C, probably means they have Y. I know, I use lots of letters, sorry. Anyway, so, watch out for these biases and making this misjudgment. All right, so, Let's go through a little scenario here and see what we have to look at, what we have to work with here. So, 62-year-old female complaining of chest pain. Should be pretty straightforward. We run this uh, bread and butter call, run them all the time. You place her on OP2, you get uh, vital signs, you give her four baby aspirins, and you go through your OPQRST. Now, I'm probably going to do my OPQRST before aspirin, but that's here nor there. All right, so we go through all that information. We note that she's tachycardic, a little bit hypertensive, and um, we get a 12 lead and transmit it. What's it say? Well, we have ST elevation in three contiguous leads, 2, 3, and AVF. Notice we have not given nitro yet. Nitro is a medication that we should should give to a chest pain patient and a patient who is ischem having ischemic chest pain. We've now identified that this patient has an inferior MI. Remember, leads 2, 3, and AVF are the, the one section of the heart that has three contiguous leads, and that is inferior, is the inferior segment of the heart. So, we have indications of an inferior MI. An inferior MI should uh, prompt you to do a right side 12 lead. Me move V4 from under the left nipple to under the right nipple, so V4R. So, 2, 3, and AVF, and now V4R. V4R will tell us whether we have a right ventricular involvement. We may or may not, I'm not going to say. I but statistically, 40% of inferior MIs will have right ventricular involvement. If so, you want to be very cautious with the use of nitro. Um, a lot of protocols say that nitro would be contraindicated in an inferior MI. Some go as far as to say, not an inferior, in a right-sided MI. Some would go as far to say that you should avoid its use in an inferior MI. That is going to be protocol specific. Do not be lulled into a false sense of security just because your patient has a blood pressure of 142 over 89. That could drop really, really quick if they're having a right-sided MI. Um, and I've seen it happen for patients who were only showing ischemia. They were not showing an MI. Uh, there was just ischemia, and their pressure went from like 142 down to like 90 after one nitro. Now, of course, it's going to come back, and it's all a question of can they maintain mental status? Do they have um, cerebral perfusion during that period of time? Now, let's go back to our scenario here, the progression. So you go to move the patient from the couch to your stretcher. Remember, you've already identified that this patient has an inferior MI. So we know that we can't have the patient get up and walk. So you're lifting the patient to the stretcher and she passes out. Now, it could be a number of different things. I've often seen people who were in the reclined or sitting position, you get them up, you try to move them and it causes like a um, orthostatic event and they become unresponsive or they have a syncopal episode and tend to come back as soon as you sit them back up or I mean, excuse me, as soon as you lay them back down. Well, in this case, the patient's EKG is now showing V-fib. So this is a little bit different than simply a um, thinkable episode or hypotension. So obviously you're gonna start working your code, chest compressions, OPAs inserted, defibrillation. Remember, this patient was a witnessed arrest. You were talking to her. You have a 12 lead showing sinus tack, and now she's in VFib. You do not have to do two minutes of CPR before defibrillation. Likely, you do not have EKG pads on the patient yet because you just ran a 12 lead and you're moving her to the stretcher. If you do, wow, good job. Way to go. When you have a STEMI, EKG pads should be available and a lot of protocols will say on you're going to find at the hospital they've already got the pads on um so because this was a witnessed arrest you can defibrillate as soon as the pads are up and going but you're going to do cpr while you get the pads and the monitor ready to go 
but as soon as it's ready, you can defibrillate 200 joules. It's a good starting point. Now, if that's with a biphasic, because you're going to go 200, 300, or 300, and then 360. If it's a monophasic, or excuse me, by the a monophasic monitor, you're going to start at 200 joules. Second dose will be 300. Third dose will be 360. If you're dealing with a biphasic monitor, your first dose could be 150 and your second dose would be 200. Or you could start at 200 at the beginning. There is not necessarily a right or a wrong there. So don't stress that one out too much. Excuse me. So you deliver your 200 joules. course you go on through the whole process clear 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 fire all right perform the defibrillation you immediately start back to chest compressions you are um establishing an iv thankfully we haven't given nitro yet only thing we had on board was aspirin once the iv is established you're going to start with your first line medication that first line medication should be epinephrine let me let me do something here Stand by. All right, I'm back. So, run back through. Patient started out with V-fib. Then we started CPR immediately. Following the CPR, we defibrillated them at 200 joules. We'll say that this was a monophasic. And then our first medication is going to be epi, one milligram of one to 10,000 IV. I am a stickler when it comes to you doing these scenarios. When I say, what is a medication? What med are you going to give? You need to name it. You need the vol the dose, you know, the one milligram, half a milligram, whatever it is, and the route. Now, in this case, it's epi 1 to 10,000. We could, for argument's sake, say that I'm supposed to write it this way, epi 1 to 10,000, one milligram. IV push, IVP. You can do that. Or IV bolus, whichever one you prefer to say. That's not the point. But the point is the medication specifically, the dose and the route. Those are important uh, that you always know that so you don't get confused. All right. So we started this and I just realized I don't want to confuse anybody. So we defibrillated them and we immediately went back to CPR and then we'll do the epi one to 10,000, one milligram I, V, and P. So there we go. That's our first. Now we've given the epi, we're at our two minute mark. We've now done, you know, we want to go, so we'll call this zero minute. So now at two minutes, we're going to do a rhythm check. We're going to evaluate, is this still V-fib? Yes, we'll say it's still V-fib. So now we're going to defibrillate again. And that's at our two minute mark. Why did I put a zero here? So um, why did I make this zero minutes and this two minutes? Well, our two minute count for uh, in between defibrillations starts from the first one. Remember, this was witnessed. <coughs> ah. Anyway, is a witnessed arrest. So we don't have to do two minutes of CPR from the beginning. So we don't have to start counting our two minute intervals until our first defibrillation. So we defibrillated, we do two minutes of CPR. Two minutes later, we look, it's still V-fib. We're gonna defibrillate again. Since this is a monophasic, our second dose is 300 joules. So second dose of 300 joules and we start CPR again. At this point in time, we're ready for our next medication. We've already got an IV on board. We've already got one epi on board. We defibrillated twice. So we are ready for our first antiarrhythmic. Because the patient was showing V-fib during our last rhythm check, which, you know, rhythm check, oh, it's V-fib, defibrillate, 300 joules, start CPR. We can now treat it as if it's still V-fib. So the first medication that we could do here would be amiodarone. Which is our first dose is 300 milligrams IV push. Or we could do lidocaine, which would be one 
to 1.5 milligrams per kilogram IV push. Either one of those could be the first antiarrhythmic. So this is an antiarrhythmic. Remember, epi is a vasoconstrictor, amiodarone and lidocaine, these are antiarrhythmics. So now we're at four minutes. We've done this for four minutes and it's time to do a rhythm check. And it's still V-fib. So we defibrillate again. And what is our dose this time? Well, it's 360 joules. So we've now defibrillated three times. As soon as we defibrillate, we immediately start CPR again. Notice we gave epi after the zero minute. So that means we can give epi again. We are now due for our next epi. Um, Epi one to ten zero 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 one milligram IVP. Now you'll notice that it says um, <clears throat> an anti dysrhythmic is administered. That is an incorrect statement on this part of the slide. That's what threw me a for a second. It says there is a rhythm, but no pulse. That would indicate that you have PEA. PEA, pulseless electrical activity, gets treated with epinephrine. It does not get treated with, am with an antiarrhythmic. The antidysrhythmics, amiodarone and lidocaine, are only given when you have VFib or VTAC. Now, if my patient is in cardiac arrest with VFib or VTAC, and I gave amiodarone or lidocaine, either one, and now I have pulses back, I have a blood pressure, I've restored rhythm, we have ROSC, return of spontaneous circulation. Woohoo! Great! I can hang an infusion of either amiodarone or lidocaine. If I gave amiodarone as the IV push, then I hang the infusion of amiodarone. If I gave lidocaine as the IV push, then I hang lidocaine as the infusion. I can do that to keep them from going back into VFib or VTEC, but if I see a systole or PEA on the monitor, a rhythm with no pulse, we do not give amiodarone or lidocaine. That is not indicated for PEA and a systole. I want that to be incredibly clear. I don't understand why this is, was put here. That is wrong. Um, But it would be time for another epi. Epi is the IV med that we will continue to use every four minutes or the, you know, it could be three to five minutes, but AHA has been gracious and has decided to finally agree with me and make it every four minutes after every defibrillate, every other defibrillation. If your defibrillations are being consistently done on two minute cycles. So we're good for do our next IV push of epi. So we've got two epis on board and one dose of antiarrhythmic. So cool. Um, and we're still doing CPR. So this point, we have a pulseless electrical activity. We have an organized rhythm on the monitor with no palpable pulse, PEA. This is a good time to roll back on our ankles and think, what is the cause? Why is this patient in cardiac arrest? Well, we know that she was having an MI, so we probably associate this cardiac arrest with that MI. And so we're gonna start running down our H's and T's, but is there something else going on here? Hypoglycemia, hypovolemia, hypoxia, acidosis, also known as hydrogen ions. Hypo or hyperkalemia, hypothermia, hyperglycemia, tension pneumos, uh, a cardiac tamponade, toxins such as a drug overdose of some sort or any other toxin or poison that they could have gotten into, pulmonary thrombosis, also known as a PE, um, coronary thrombosis, a cardiac or a MI, cardiac event, which we've already identified. So that's probably the problem here or some form of trauma. Well, there was no indication of trauma, nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea, so we don't think that it's trauma or hypovolemia. Her O2 sats were not noted as being unique, so it was probably not hypoxia. There was no abnormalities to the T waves described in the 12 lead, so we're not thinking a uh, electrolyte imbalance or anything like that. So narrowing it down, it's probably looking at a 
uh, am I that has caused this? So, do we wait until the patient is in PEA or um, assistedly to start considering our H's and T's? You don't have to. Um, I am a big fan of considering my H's and T's as I walk through the door. I start looking at the patient. What is my scene size up? What are my surroundings? What's my information? And I'm going to start thinking H's and T's right there. Because if this is a diabetic problem, if this came from a respiratory cause or a drug-induced cause or some other concern like that, I can intervene with those early in the arrest. Does not prevent me from doing CPR, should not prevent me from doing defibrillations, should not prevent me from giving my epis and all that. I can give some form of other medication, you know, whether that's like Narcan or D5 or D50, I mean, not D5, we don't use that, but D10 or D50 or, um, you know, albu albuterols or something like that for, you know, through an ET tube, whatever it happens to be that caused the arrest. I think of that as I'm beginning. As that beginner medic, you may need to put that off a little bit until you get your initial couple of rounds of CPR, defibrillations, epis, antiarrhythmics, all that stuff on board. And now at that time, normal physiologic progression of uh, cardiac arrest, the patient's probably going to be in a asystole or a PEA at that point. So there you go. And that's when you would start thinking H's and T's. All right, so we've done your four minute, de uh, so at your six minute mark, it's time for another rhythm check and defib. Now here's the thing again, I don't understand. It said we had a rhythm with no pulse. Why are we shocking? If this patient is in PEA, we don't shock it, we don't defibrillate. If they're in a systole, we don't defibrillate. Now, one thing, I'm going to double check this. It says there is a rhythm but no pulse. It is possible that this patient is um, in a VTAC. It doesn't say that it's a wide complex, but it is possible. In which case, if this is a wide complex pulseless VTAC, crazy unlikely that it would go VFib to VTAC. Normally it goes VTAC to VFib, but... If that was the case, then you would have given the antiarrhythmic for the pulseless VTAC, just like you would have for VFib. It's just that is not a typical that that is not how the body progresses. So, um, all right. So we're going to defibrillate. Apparently, this is VTAC because we would never defibrillate PEA or assistedly. I don't care what you saw on a TV show or saw an ER doctor do, but. You do not defibrillate PEAs and asystole. So after your six minute mark and your fourth defibrillation, which would again be 360 joules because we've maxed out. So we're gonna just stick to 300 joules, 360 joules the whole long. It says the patient wakes up. I don't know what fantasy world we are living in. You've been unresponsive in cardiac arrest for six minutes. You do not simply wake up. One does not simply wake up. They may get a pulse, they may get a blood pressure, and they may start having some responsiveness, but it is not like, a, oh yeah, they woke up. No, not happening. However, they could start having their um, function and things like that. In which case, you have a pulse, great. Blood pressure, immediate. First thing out of your mouth, you have a pulse. What's my blood pressure? I need a blood pressure. You need to know that because yes, good, wonderful, we have a pulse, but what good is the pulse doing if the blood pressure is not adequate? So we need a blood pressure. And ladies and gentlemen, I have seen every blood pressure on the planet after cardiac arrest. It could be low, it could be high, it could be perfect, it could be all over the place. What have I been giving? What have I done for this patient? I've already given them two doses of epinephrine, two milligrams of epi. That is a potent vasoconstrictor, but it's also short acting. So that blood pressure could be great, all because their epi is on board. The joke is you can give enough epi to make a rock have a pulse. Well, you know, might be. I don't know. Does the rock have a heart? Um, 
So, check that blood pressure, but continue to monitor the blood pressure in very short windows. You know, this is not a, we're gonna check the blood pressure every 15 minutes. I'm gonna be checking this blood pressure every minute, every, you know, every 30, like I wanna know constantly, what's this blood pressure doing? Because if the blood pressure starts trending down, then I know I need to be doing something else. Do I need to give fluids? Probably not. This is a cardiac arrest happened from a card, cardiac event, an MI, cardiogenic shock. Don't give fluids to cardiogenic shock. So, all right, we're not gonna do that. Not gonna give fluids. Oh, wait. Epi got her out, antiarrhythmics got her out. Let's give an epi drip. We can also hang a antiarrhythmic drip, whether we did the Lido or the Amio. We have a pulse now, we have a blood pressure, we can hang a drip. If we're going to hang epi and lidocaine, theoretically, or um, amiodarone, theoretically they can run through the same line, but because they're both med infusions, I would recommend using different lines. Do two different lines, two different arms. It is always best to avoid mixing any medications whatsoever and never administer bolus medications through the line that you are giving a med infusion through. Uh, you just don't want that mess. So we could be considering an epi drip or a dopamine drip in order to maintain their blood pressure. We could also consider a... Um, Why am I blanking? Oh, an amiodarone or a lidocaine drip as appropriate to prevent them from going back into VFib or VTAC. So that's an option. Now, we have gotten ROSC. We've gotten their, we're trying to stabilize their blood pressure. I am not going to sit around on the scene until their blood pressure is stabilized. I'm going to do that in route, but we've gotten ROSC. So what do we do? We now transport this to the most appropriate facility. In this case, that most appropriate facility will be the closest hospital with a cath lab. She needs to go to a cath table immediately to be able to correct this inferior MI. So we don't just go to any hospital. We go to the one with the cath lab that we know will be able to correct it because this chick is not going to live through an exploratory cath and then being transferred to a facility to do an actual intervention. So we want to go to an interventionalist as quickly as possible. So... That's a quick rundown of some of the things to be thinking about when you're looking at a cardiac arrest. What caused it? Why are we here? Why are we doing this? What do we need to do? What interventions are necessary? I will point out, I did not get into it. If we were going to do the epi drip, an epi drip is 2 to 10, although I've seen a lot of literature that puts it all the way up to 30. It just depends on your uh, protocols, but the common one is 2 to 10 micrograms per minute. This is not a weight-based drug. This is a in standard infusion, and you can put one milligram into um, a 250 bag. That is the standard um, mix, and that gives you a four microgram per milliliter concentration. You could mix, mix this one milligram into a thousand bag and give yourself a one microgram per milliliter concentration. That's possible. It's a thing that just means you're going to have to give a whole lot more fluid in order to get that. That means you're having to give 10 milliliters a minute, which if you're using a 60 drop set is 600 drops a minute. I would hope you're using a 10 drop set which is still 100 drops a minute when you get up to that 10 microgram dose. So that's why I use one milligram of epi in a 250 milliliter bag of saline using a 60 drop set at that four microgram per milliliter concentration. So that's the epi drip. Um, like I said, two to 10 micrograms per minute, not weight based you might find some recommendations that will let you go all the way up to 30 micrograms per minute. All right, another option would be the dopamine. Dopamine is a much more complex drug to calculate. Your dopamine is going to be two to 20. I've seen anywhere from two to five to five to 10 to two to 20. Like it could be anywhere from in that range, but two to 20 micrograms per kilogram per minute. So now this is weight based. It comes standard as 800 milligrams in 500 milliliters.
500 milliliter, which is 1600 micrograms per milliliter. That is the standard concentration of uh, dopamine. Now, those are your vasopressors that you could give. I can also, because I mentioned earlier that we're going to hang that, or we're going to push an antiarrhythmic like amiodarone or lidocaine, we can now hang the amiodarone or lidocaine as a drip. And just as a reminder, amiodarone is going to be 150 milligrams over 10 minutes. So mix that in like a 250 bag or a 100 bag and then infuse that over a 10 minute time frame. Um, I would use, I personally would prefer to put 150 milligrams into a 100 bag using a 10 drop set, 100 milliliters in 10 minutes. So that's um, 10 milliliters a minute, which with a 10 drop set is 100 drops per minute. Very easy math. Um, so 150 milliliters in... 100, 150 milligrams and 150 milliliters given over 10 minute means 100 drops a minute. All right, so that would be the amio. Lidocaine, we said we could give 1 to 1.5 lidocaine as the bolus well a lidocaine drip is going to be half of that but it's one to four milligrams i said half i meant um never mind double one to four milligrams per minute it is not weight based whereas the bolus was weight based the lidocaine drip is not so it is just simply you pick one to four milligrams per minute and you might say well where do you start how do you know what to give well if you gave a one milligram per kilogram bolus a good place to start is at two milligrams per minute if you gave a 1.5 milligram per kilogram bolus a good place to start is three um milligrams per minute but either way you're going to go one to four milligrams per minute and you're going to titrate to the effect like and this is where i'm going to look at it and i'm like well i see that this patient's showing us to be there in a perfusing rhythm with a blood pressure but i'm getting a bunch of pvcs popping up well i'm going to start hanging that amiodarone or lidocaine that antiarrhythmic of some sort in order to prevent those pvcs from aggravating the heart and going back into cardiac arrest into a v-fib or a v-tac that's just how i'm going to process through that so um the lidocaine one to four milligrams per minute if you have it generally speaking that gets uh, mixed up in a concentration of one gram per 250 milliliters equaling four milligrams per milliliter and that's your thing so if you're using a 60 drop set your um you're looking at one uh four four milligrams per milliliter of fluid uh so like a two milligram per minute of rate would be or dose would be half a milliliter per minute 30 drops per minute one drop every other second uh, one drop every two seconds so it's pretty easy drug dose to calculate so those are some of your drug do uh drips that you could look at i'm gonna um pop that up full screen if you want to pause this and write those down i'll put this back that's uh, amiodarone's first dose was the 100 uh, was 300 milligrams ivp or you could do the lido 1 to 1.5 milligrams per kilogram of ivp those are your initial antiarrhythmic medications during the cardiac arrest and then these are the drips so, or I should say, the proper way to say that would be infuse.
So there you go. All right. Um, you pause this, screenshot it, whatever you want to do, and gives you an idea how that goes. All right. At this point, why don't you go ahead and take a quick break, uh, stretch your legs, pause the video. All right. I hope you got a nice break. I was able to stretch your legs, clear your mind, because now we are going to talk about shock. So what is shock? Shock, as you can see, it's got this one definition. Another simple definition of it is inadequate perfusion to the tissue so whether to or at least to the vital organs so the brain kidneys lungs liver things like that um, we will see shock present with the inadequate perfusion to the extremities however um, we don't normally get as concerned about the lack thereof or the lack of perfusion to their regions because it is the um, that was annoying me because it was is um nah. we don't normally get as worried about the perfusion to the extremities because they can go longer without oxygen but they can lead to major problems which is what we're going to see here and it's one of the areas or one of the reasons shock can lead to death all right so what is perfusion perfusion is the delivery of blood in adequate amounts to the correct cells so this is did the heart pump the blood to the brain, to the kidney, to the liver, wherever it happens to be? Now, this does this is minimum required before oxygenation can happen, before nutrients can be delivered, glucose and all and waste can be removed. You have to have perfusion to happen. But it doesn't mean that you're having oxygenation. It doesn't mean you aren't still going to have an issue. So we understand the cardiovascular system. We just went through cardiology recently. So we have the heart with the four chambers, the two sides. We have the right ventricle and right atria that pumps blood into the lungs. That Then the blood goes back into the left atria, into the left ventricle, and is pumped throughout the body where it delivers that blood to the brain, delivering oxygen, um, the kidneys, and so on and so forth, re acquiring nutrients out of the GI tract and through the liver process and so so on and back to the heart where it then gets re-oxygenated in the lungs so <coughs> excuse me all right sorry about that <clears throat> so in order for this system to work you have to have these three pro um, pieces you have to have the pump you have to have the pipes and you have to have fluid the pump has to work. The heart has to move. The heart has to move the blood. The pipes have to be in adequate size and function so that they don't allow leakage of the fluid so it completes a full circuit. And you have to have an adequate quantity of fluid to fill those pipes. You're a firefighter. I've had experience with firefighting in the past. You might be familiar with the problems when you're trying to flow too much GPM off of a hydrant that cannot supply the volume that you need and how the hoses might start to get soft or you can't get a good stream off your master stream your dead gun or something like that this is where you have an inadequate volume an inadequate flu fluid quantity to keep the pressures that you need <clears throat> Or if you were trying to run a garden hose or trying to run, run a fire hose or whatever and you are at the nozzle and you're trying to spray hose, um, get pressure, but you're not getting any pressure because of leaks in the system. The, t the hose is leaking and so you're losing fluid all along the system so you have no pressure at the end. Now, unlike firefighting or gardening or something like that, when the water is coming out the end of the hose, at a certain pressure in your heart and your system, your circular system, circulatory system, <clears throat> your system, that pressure ends up back at the heart again. So are we getting adequate blood pressure returned to the heart? That's what we're looking for. And if you have leaking leaks in the system, if there's damage or whatever, then you're not going to get that adequate blood return. And so these three things, pump, fluid, and pipes, those are... <clears throat> Those are going to be associated with the different categories of shock that we're going to look at. So let's talk a little about the heart. Remember, 
cardiac output is the amount of blood that the heart can move in one minute. Um, this is a combination of both the stroke volume, which is the amount of blood that is moved in one contraction, and the heart rate. For this to happen, the blood has to return to the heart. This is why a complete circulatory system is necessary, why we worry about that preload. Is the blood making it back to the heart? <clears throat> now, with cardiac output and our systemic vascular resistance or peripheral vascular resistance, whichever term you want to use, they're not 100% interchangeable, but for the purposes of blood pressure, they really, they are essentially the same you're confused on them, but they are not 100% interchangeable. Anyway, your blood pressure will be determined by both the cardiac output and the constriction of the veins. If your heart is not constricting enough, then your, <clears throat> excuse me, If your heart is not contracting enough, then you're not going to have the pressure output. If your vessels are too dilated or too constricted, then you're not going to have the pressure output or the pressure that you need. And so these are these play together in that sense. <clears throat> so I already mentioned this. Cardiac output, stroke volume times heart rate. Blood pressure, cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance. The mean arterial pressure is that combination of the two where you have your you take your blood pressure, you subtract No, that is, um, oh, never mind. Okay, I don't know why they have that little sign in front of map. That's what threw me. All right, map equals diastolic plus one third of the systolic minus diastolic. It might seem a little confusing, but your monitor will um, tell you what that is. Now, uh, it'll t tell you if it'll say like 120 over 80, and they'll have a little number in there. It's like 89. That is your map that that small number. Now, if you take your blood pressure and you subtract the map, then your patient, that will give you your cerebral perf no, map t minus intracranial pressure, cerebral perfusion pressure. I'm confusing my formulas. Never mind. Ignore me on that one. So diastolic plus one third of systolic minus diastolic. So let's say if your systolic is 120, and your diastolic is 80, so 120 minus 80 is 40. One third of 40 is going to be 13.3 uh, or 33, whatever. So 80 plus 13.3, which would be 93.3. So the map of a 120 over 80 blood pressure should be 93. <clears throat> that is your mean arterial pressure. Honestly, here in the future, I really expect that we will see maps becoming much more common and much more focused. I believe that, well, if you look at a lot of different uh, studies and research being done both in Europe and Asia, a lot of the tests and evaluations are being done on a basis of their map pressure, not their systolic or diastolic pressure. So I expect that we will see map and dia systolic or excuse me map becoming the new standard or we're not going to worry as much about your systolic and diastolic we're going to worry about what's their map and do we have adequate map <clears throat> so here's a chart that can break that down if you're a chart person you could even figure out a way to make this um small um and keep it on a badge or hang it on the wall in your ambulance or something like that if you're wanting to keep this handy. But remember, most modern automatic blood pressure machines will give you the map autom um, went automatically. But um, if you're doing the manual blood pressures, this is how you would convert it. There's a, dozens of apps and websites and all that that will convert it two but this could be much quicker and easier in the back of an ambulance where you just compare your systolics to your diastolics and obviously you can use rough figures to determine what's your map i think it's also important to note that whenever we're dealing with critical patients shock or anything like that that we are considering what the trend is we should not focus heavily on what actually is going wrong or, or what you know what it act, the actual number is as much as is it getting better or is it getting worse we could start really good and we're like oh we don't have to worry about it it's good but if it's slowly getting worse well we should be worried about that way before it gets to bad numbers so 
How does the cardiovascular system work? Well, controlled the automatic autonomic nervous system, sympathetic and parasympathetic. So the sympathetic is going to be your fight or flight. This is where your epi and your norepinephrine are going to increase cardiac contractility, heart rate, respiratory rate, bronchial dilation, and vasoconstriction. Your parasympathetic nervous system, the feed or breed, that's where you're going to have the acetylcholine dumps. You're going to have everything slow down, focused on digestion, decrease your... Um, cardiac output, decreased vasoconstriction, shunting blood to the core uh, for digestion purposes and things like that. <clears throat> so you can see the what I was just explaining, the various things being associated with those um, two. So sympathetic versus parasympathetic. Um, sympathetic being on the viewer's left and the parasympathetic being on the viewer's right. All right, sorry about that. <clears throat> so, I just realized that I don't think you guys have been seeing the, oops. Not make this work, there we go. That's what I was trying to go for. I just realized you guys probably weren't seeing that. So, there you go. Um, <clears throat> to show you real quick. Um, so there's your map. Um, calculations that I was just talking about a minute ago if you want to look at those again and there's your mean arterial pressure chart if you want to look that up and um, here is the chart describing like I said the one on the left is the sympathetic nervous system and the one on the right is the parasympathetic nervous system so let's talk about oxygenation and respirations <clears throat> so alveoli blah 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 yeah and understand that oxygen has to come into the lungs in order to get into the blood blood has to come into the lungs in order to get the oxygen so you've got to have the perfusion already now that we have the perfusion and blood getting into the lungs we now need to make sure that oxygen can make it through. So do we have adequate airway? Do we have adequate ventilation status? Is there adequate oxygen in the environment? Is there anything in the alveoli walls that are preventing or blocking that oxygen um, from getting, you know, as fluid or phlegm or something like that, preventing the oxygen molecules from diffusing through the cell membranes into the alveolar membrane into the capillaries into the onto the blood cells. So at the same time, while that is happening, carbon dioxide is being exhaled. It's diffusing out of the blood into interstitial fluids and into the alveoli walls and then into the alveoli air <clears throat> to be exhaled. So carbonic acid is one of the primary transporters of that carbon dioxide and water in the blood. So how are we regulating blood flow? Well, blood flow is going to be handled predominantly through sphincter control. So let me flip to the whiteboard. <coughs> Excuse me, this water is killing me. All right, so let's say that we have a capillary bed that I don't want to make it black, so or blue, I want... So we have a capillary bed like this, you know, we have an... All right, so this is the artery side. <clears throat> this is the vein side. Return, and then it starts to split into a whole bunch of more capillaries, you know, yada yada. Got a bunch of little <clears throat> I 
I am just such a wonderful artist. I know you're so excited to see my drawings, but yeah, I think that I'm starting to get the point across that I can't draw. <clears throat> yeah anyway so we'll just you know we'll just go with that right and um so this is our capillary bed we have the vein the arteries bringing in blood over here veins bringing out the blood over there obviously this has o2 on it this has co2 on it um so red blood comes in Blue blood leaves, something like that. Anyway, inside the veins, we are going to use sphincters to control this. This is part of the autonomic nervous system. Part of the fight or flight with the epi is to close down sphincters <clears throat> that will shut off these capillary beds. So you might have a large sphincter right here clamp that down and then another one over here clamping this side down and these sphincters are going to isolate all blood flow through that capillary bed that is what will make this patch let's say this is a skin capillary bed that is what will make this patch of skin <clears throat> turn pale it will lose its color it will blanch if you want to put it that way but it will become pale and so that's what's going on there so backing uh back to our powerpoint yeah, you can look at my ugly mug all right so back to our powerpoint <clears throat> blood flows through the capillary beds it's regulated by these sphincters you can see autonomic yep so when our body is showing shock when our body isn't able to adequately perfuse the vital organs that will shut down various unnecessary or less vital areas of the body so like your skin bone muscle things like that and so your um, capillary sphincters will close moving blood away from those this will maintain perfusion to your various cells and organs as you can see <clears throat> cells are the smallest and then you have tissues organs organ systems and organism you are you and I are an organism so the body will sacrifice cells and tissues in some areas in order to preserve the organs and tissues in other areas in an effort to maintain those the vital organ systems because without those vital organ systems cardiovascular renal uh, hepatic and things like neurologic without those systems the the entire organism will fail so <clears throat> that's the goal here this is the perfusion triangle. Uh, it's another way to look at shock if this is what works for you. You can see heart has the, uh, is the pump. And I kind of already went over this. So I really don't feel like there's a lot new to this material. <clears throat> However, we will define shock as when one of these three items is not working properly. So. We understand what blood is, we understand what the blood vessels are, and I think we should know what a blood clot is. So, what causes them to form though? Well, <clears throat> if the um, there is a chemical change in the wall of the blood vessel, such as the um, there's a damage to a trauma, whether it's internal or external trauma, blood clots will start forming along that damage. If the blood stops moving due to a blockage of of some sort the blood will start to clot if there is a problem or change with the blood's chemistry such as the um, pH is off or certain clotting enzymes clotting factors and such are not present then this could positively or negatively affect the ability for the blood to clot so these are various things there so <clears throat> 
What happens? Well, our blood pressure starts to fail. This is how shock's going to work. This is what's going to happen. Blood pressure starts to fall, and our brain is going to kick in more hormones, such as epinephrine and norepinephrine, to start boosting our pulse rate, cardiac contractility, and that vasoconstriction. Those are the beta-1 and alpha receptors. <clears throat> This fluid shift is going to move the blood away from the extremities and into the core of the body in an effort to maintain perfusion to the brain and liver and kidneys. Brain and kidneys being the most concerning at the moment. <clears throat> In order to do this, we see this compensation. We know the body has said we are not getting adequate perfusion, so increase heart rate, increase contractility, increase vasoconstriction. Tachycardia, tachypnea, pale, cool, clammy skin. That is how the patient will present. Blood pressure is good because the patient is still compensating. They are still maintaining adequate perfusion. It's just working harder to do it. So compensating is normal results with more effort to get there. So normal blood pressure with more effort to maintain. So baroreceptors is where we're talking about varying pressure and reading pressure and then chemoreceptors for measuring the shift in carbon dioxide and arterial blood. And if that's saying, well, we're not getting adequate carbon dioxide removal or we're not getting adequate oxygen present in the arterial blood or something along those lines, then it'll start moving blood more quickly, more aggressively into the lungs. So that's um, what it's talking about there, or that's where the chemoreceptors come in too. So as you can see, um, <clears throat> When that blood pressure drops to that pressure within that specific arteriole or something, then the systolic pressure, like for example in the brain, it's going to stay, eh, 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 get that pressure up. That's where the baroreceptors will activate within the brain. So, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system will also activate in this case. This is a process where renin is released by the uh, adrenals and or by the kidneys and then the renin binds with the angiotensin angiotensin uh it's actually angiotensinogen which creates angiotensin 2 um and that con or angiotensin 1 excuse me and then ace ace um angiotensin converting enzyme converts angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2 and then angiotensin 2 releases or stimulates, I should say, stimulates the release of aldosterone from the adrenal, the adrenal glands. So it's a long process, low blood flow in the kidneys, renin is released. Renin interacts with angiotensinogen. Angiotensinogen creates angiotensin 1, which is then converted to angiotensin 2, and aldosterone is stimulated to be released from the adrenal glands as a result of angiotensin 2. If you've ever heard of the medication class ACE inhibitors, that is angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. ACE inhibitors specifically prevent angiotensin 1 from becoming angiotensin 2. That's uh, lisinoprils, and um, captopril. These are your are examples of ACE inhibitors, uh, anything that ends in a pril. And they and what, well, let me back it up. So what aldosterone does is aldosterone prevents the loss of fluid from the kidneys. It operates in the distal convoluted tubules of the nephrons and it causes a reabsorption of fluid due to a reuptake of sodium. Um, <clears throat> so the patient will retain fluids. This is done to maintain blood volume. Now, if your patient's condition is that it is hypovolemic and, excuse me, if your patient is hypertensive and the doctors prescribe them a angiotensin converting enzyme, it will prevent angiotensin 2 from being made, which means aldosterone does not cause the reabsorption of fluid and sodium, which means sodium and fluid and water is lost in the distal convoluted tubule, lost into the urine. And <clears throat> that that is the how the blood pressure is then lowered so by reducing sodium and reducing um, fluid volume. 
this results in a production of bradykinin and that causes you to have the dry cough which is commonly associated with uh, ACE inhibitors of various types a very common side effect of ACE inhibitors all right so <clears throat> So what is the goal here? What is the heart trying to do? What is the body trying to do? Well, it's trying to increase preload. It's trying to uh, make certain that you have enough blood returning to the heart to be able to have good stroke volume and adequate pulse rate. This will maintain perfusion throughout the body. When... Um, when this happens through a shunting effort, your oxygen excuse me, you were going to have decreased oxygen delivery to those tissues where the sphincters have shut off those capillary beds, where you're shunting blood away from. And this can cause those cells in those capillary beds. So if I go back to my whiteboard here, uh, it will cause these cells and well, let's just pick a different color. What color should I say? These are our cells surrounding the... Um, capillary beds and you know we have a bunch of little nucleuses here so it's going to cause these cells to um i'm you know not a great artist so anyway it'll cause these cells to start showing signs of hypoxia they'll switch to metabolic um, acidosis, excuse me, they will switch to anaerobic metabolism. That's what's going to happen. So they switch to anaerobic metabolism. <clears throat> and as a result, they will increase with the production of CO2 and lactic acid. And that's what will... Uh, start to build up in the capillary beds. Oops. So, we already mentioned this and how this works. So, um, when the heart is unable to maintain perfusion, when you start to lose preload and you have a diminished cardiac output, you will have a diminished diastolic pressure. This means you won't have enough blood to recirculate into the coronary arteries. Remember, the blood for the coronary arteries comes from the aorta just after the aortic valve and during diastole when the heart relaxes. The resting pressure of the aorta squeezes blood backwards into the coronary arteries and perfuses the heart. If you don't have enough pressure, if you don't have enough at lasting pressure or it's called afterload in the aorta, you're not going to have adequate perfusion of the coronary arteries. <clears throat> and the, as you can see, you will also have diminished uh, perfusion to your liver, to your GI tract, and you're not going to be producing um, urine as much. When you start to produce less urine, your glomeruluses will constrict also due to a lack of pressure. They will constrict because they're trying to maintain as much blood as they can. Constricted glomeruluses mean the filters are tighter, smaller. Um, smaller objects will get or larger objects will get stuck in these filters because your pores have been constricted down. They won't pass through as effectively. So Let's go back to the whiteboard and look at this again. So as I said before, we are trying to deliver O2 into these cells and CO2 is, is leaving the cells. So CO2 leaves, O2 is entering. Well, if you don't have adequate um, oxygen, so we get rid of our oxygen delivery here, we're going to have more CO2 built up, but we will also start to produce lactic acid. And lactic acid, or um, also in form of hydrogen ion, lactic acid is pyruvate that are, um, is then fermented into lactic acid, so I'm not going to draw the chemical formula it's not as simple as co2 or o2 um, but lactic acid is going to start building up in these capillaries in this way so we're going to have high volumes of co2 in this blood and we're going to have high volumes of lactic acid lactic acid all over the place 
And if you've ever done a lot of anaerobic exercises, like you've done some hard running or something like that for a while, you'll probably have felt the pain and discomfort in your leg muscles afterwards because of the amount of lactic acid that was built up with them. It's where some of the cramping comes in and then you have to stretch them and massage them to try to um, <clears throat> uh, relieve that pressure. This also results in the buildup of hydrogen. Now what's going on here is lactic acid is acidic so it's causing our hydrogen levels to increase. Our pH is going down. So pH goes down becoming acidic. So the capillary beds are now acidic. Now, we would call this systemic acidosis. This is specifically respiratory acidosis because the problem was caused by a lack of oxygen and too much CO2 and lactic acid not being removed from the area. That's because the sphincters have shut it down over here and over here. So your fluids have built up. Now, what that does is remember why do we need oops, why do we need to have oxygen why do we need oxygen and glucose to always process at the cells what is it used for you know obviously we know that oxygen when it's not present results in lactic acid buildup but what, where is this process happening in the first place well we're trying to produce atp Remember, glucose goes to the cells, splits through glycolysis, you get ATP from it. Then the, the pyruvate byproduct goes through the Krebs cycle and more ATP is consumed or is produced from it. Combine that with more oxygen in the electron transport chain and you get large quantities of ATP. Why do we need ATP? Well, ATP is what makes the muscles function. ATP is what makes the nerves function. ATP is what powers all the proton pumps or, or the electrolyte pumps, the um, <clears throat> sodium and potassium, not protons. That's in the GI tract. Something. Like that. Anyway, ATP is what powers the sodium and potassium pumps to maintain that chemical differential across the membrane. So if I was to draw our nice little cell membrane over here, you know, we got that bilayer membrane here and we have, I don't know what color I should use for sodium. So we have sodium over here and A and we have potassium over here so and they are on either side of the membrane well remember we have the little pumps that are present on that membrane and they're supposed to exchange sodium and potassium back and forth but to do that they have to have ATP there to run the pump. Well, when the pumps shut down, then sodium starts to seep in. Potassium starts seeping out. You start to have major electrolyte shifts that are not happening through the pumps. And the large quantity of sodium that's outside the cell will diffuse into the cell through channels and start causing a fluid shift because anytime that sodium moves, salts move, the water is going to move with it. So this is going to cause the cells to start to swell. So we have to have adequate oxygen delivered. We have to have this oxygen up here in order to maintain the pumps. If you remember 2005, Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans. <clears throat> Hurricane Katrina caused a lot of storm damage, rain and wind damage into the city, you know, roofs being blown off and things like that. But the real problem didn't happen until the city or the storm got further inland. What is kept further inland from the from New Orleans from the coastline? The power plants. When the storms hit the power plants and caused the power grid to shut down because of the wind damage to the power grid, that resulted in a loss of power. The loss of power shut down the generators or excuse me, the um, pumps that worked at the levees. When those pumps failed and the backup generators ran out of fuel or failed due to flooding and things like that, this resulted in the levees being breached. The pumps were no longer able to pump the water out. Now, why people thought it was a great idea to build a city below sea level, 
I don't know. They had levees that were intentionally that were designed to keep the flooding Mississippi out of the city. Well, once that those levees broke uh, because of the pump failure due to a lack of pressure, water flooded the city, and we had the disaster that became known as Katrina's, the um, New Orleans, two thousand five. This is the same thing that's happening at the cells in the cap at the capillary level. When the ATP pumps stop having ATP, they run out of power, sodium rushes into the cell, water rushes into it as well, and it causes the cells to swell up and ultimately burst. It's called lysis. So <clears throat> once that happens, you have a large amount of um, intracellular contents, pieces and parts of the cell, myoglobins, potassium. Potassium is a very co concentrated intercellular product or um, electrolyte, and it's being released into the blood. In addition to this, you have um, a diminished blood return to the heart. Remember, we've shut down the pre-capillary um, sphincters over here. And we've shut down the post capillary sphincters. So that blood is, there's no blood getting back to the heart. So the heart's pumping blood out, but it's not getting back to the venous side and not recirculating. This is recall, re resulting in decreased preload, and which means you're going to have decreased cardiac output. It's just going to circle the drain. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. <clears throat> Because of this, the nerve endings are going to stop receiving signals. They're going to stop being able to control the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine. Your sympathetic nervous system is going to start to fail. And as we've already said, we're going to have this massive buildup of lactic acid and we're going to and CO2 in the blood and it's going to start building up on that post capillary sphincter. Now, if you remember correctly, when, or, or if you've ever heard it before, I don't know, you may have heard of the idea of vas um, hyperventilating brain injury patients in order to vasoconstrict and reduce their ICP. This is a concept that when you put high levels of O2 in the blood, the vessels constrict. And when you have high levels of CO2 in the blood, the vessels dilate. So hyperventilation means we blow off the CO2, we increase this oxygen levels and the vessels will constrict. Well, in this case here, we have the opposite. We have low CO2 levels and, excuse me, we have low O2 levels. The O2 is, O2 is low and the CO2 is high. This is going to cause vasodilation. This is also going to start to stress your sphincters. So these vac these capillaries are going to start to swell out and dilate and start stretching these post-capillary sphincters. <coughs> this is going to result in a large quantity of pressure on the post-capillary sphincters, which will eventually dilate them out and break through those post-capillary sphincters. This is where you get what's called <clears throat> washout. All of this CO2, everything that's in here, all the way along, the lactic acid, the CO2, the whole nine yards, it's all going to start flushing out. The micro uh, embolisms, the myoglobin clots, the of course the blood's been stagnant, so it's already forming little blood clots. All of this stuff starts washing downstream, and you will get what's called mottled skin. You'll have some vasoconstriction in capillary beds, and other va capillary beds that will be vasodilated with lots of blood in them, and that causes this washout downstream. <clears throat> now. Now you have, because of the pH change, white blood cells can't function properly. Blood clotting can't function properly. We're not going to be able to fight infection. We're not going to be able to clot. And then the body says, wait a minute, where did all these blood clots come from? Where did all these little blood clots that came from the stagnant capillary beds are all entering the circulation in the brain, the um, blood system's like, we need to fix this. We can't have all these blood clots. And it starts releasing anti-clotting factors and breaking down the clots. Well, it breaks down the bad clots and the good clots. And by breaking down the good clots, you start bleeding out of your eyes and your nose, any of the, your mucous membranes. This is called disseminated intervascular coagulopathy. <clears throat> It's a very significant condition that can lead uh, to long-term problems. Now, if your 
concern, excuse me, if your primary cause of shock originated at a different organ system, let's say it happened because of a arterial laceration to the leg and the patient started bleeding out. All right. So that's musculoskeletal and a little bit of circulatory, right? You ultimately, you put a tourniquet on it, you stop the bleeding, but they've lost blood. They're going through this, um, vasoconstriction process and then resulting in the vasodilation due to the shock. Now all of these microcapillaries or microemboli are running through the system. You might have DIC going on. Well, all of these, this lactic acid, the hydrogen, the potassium, and the micro um, clots are all going to affect the other organs in the body. So while every tissue has its own amount of time that it can be um, ischemic, you know, like skin, muscle, bone, they can handle ischemia for quite a long time. Brain, four to six minutes, not a whole lot of time. Well, while each other organ has the ability to protect itself, oftentimes the byproducts of damage in um, the original organ or from the shock are what's going to affect other organs and we would call this multiple organ dysfunction syndrome as you can see the complement system which is part of the inflammatory process the coagulation system and the calcrine kinin system which you don't need to get into that for this course um, but anyway these are going to be activated causing further inflammation and damage in the tissue <clears throat> This is going to start sending blood clots and toxic chemicals to other tissue in the body. The kidneys, the liver, the heart, the lungs, even the brain, these will all start, so the clots will start clogging up the kidneys and the liver. The lungs are very susceptible to the high levels of CO2 and not being able to exchange gas properly. The heart does not like high levels of potassium, can have lethal arrhythmias. And so these other organs could start to shut down. This could cause from as, as little as hours to days after the initial injury, unaffected organ systems are now being affected. So your heart, your lung, your liver, your kidneys. These are the ones that are the big ones because they can tend to kill you the fastest. And this will result in death after generally 10 to 14 days. So this could be a good example of why you work a bad cardi uh, car wreck or something, a really bad trauma. You use your tourniquets, you had your golden hour, you got them to definitive care, but then you find out that they died a week or two later from kidney failure or something like that. And that's where mods comes in, multiple organ, if it was multiple organs failing. And it has everything to do with the fact that too much damage was done prior to your arrival. And regardless of our interventions, they still ultimately died. Did they die in the ambulance? No, we got them to the hospital a lot. But damage was done prior to arrival that couldn't be corrected effectively. And they had organ failure as a result. So <clears throat> that is a problem. That is one cause. Now, we've seen shock before. We've talked about it. So I'm not going to exhaust you on the specific types of shock now that we've looked a bit at what shock does and how it works. <clears throat> but as you can see, there's lots of different things that are going to cause it. We have the, and I mentioned this earlier, so I don't really want to get into it, but you might want to pause, look at this slide a little bit more and see the differences in the vessel size and what's going on here. So we have compensated and decompensated. If the shock is caused by a hemorrhage, you might have the four classes of hemorrhage, class one, two, three, and four hemorrhage. We're going to talk more of those in PHTLS and in trauma. We're not focusing heavily on hemorrhage here, but these are some of your signs and symptoms to be able to compare. What does compensated shock look like compared to decompensated shock? Remember, compensated shock is the one we want to treat. Because if we can treat it then, we treat it before it gets bad. Once they're in decompensated shock, this ship sailed already and we've got problems. We're very close to irreversible shock. And irreversible shock is just where I was talking about the organ damage being done or the tissue level hypoxia lasting long enough that organ damage will be done from mods or DIC. So... I believe that this should be pretty straightforward. Like I said earlier, compensated shock. The, the blood pressure is maintained adequate. However, we are lacking, um, we're having to work harder to maintain it.
and decompensated. We've lost more blood volume. We've had major dilation. We've had inadequate cardiac output or whatever it happens. But without the heart, increased heart rate and increase, or despite increased heart rate and contractility or vasoconstriction, there's still not enough blood pressure. And so blood pressure is dropping despite adequate or added efforts. All right, well developed. This means um, you have a very significant case. You are rapidly heading, and if, depending on how long they've been hypotensive, could indicate whether you're already in irreversible shock. So um, definitely maintain your 10 minute scene times. You don't want to be delaying transport to definitive care. Here we go, and this is what I mentioned. When I was talking about the lysis at the capillary levels, the lysis of the cells due to a um, pH shift and all that kind of stuff, this is what we're talking about. So we've already gone through a lot of our size up. We're going to talk a lot more of size up in, pH, in trauma and PHTLS. So I'm not going to spend as much time here on the size up. But shock is going to present with that pale, cool, clammy skin or possibly even cyanotic nail beds and lips. You should be able to note their mental status and awareness, their ability to track you and can interact with their environment from across the room. You know, that should give you a good idea what you're dealing with. Then use your airway breathing. You know, we already kind of went over that earlier. I mentioned that, you know, we open the airway, we maintain breathing status or, main, or uh, restore breathing status, maintain circulation, so on and so forth. Um, all right. Transport decision must be made immediately after ABCDE. You don't need vital signs. You don't need history. You don't need 12 leads. You can look at A, B, C, D, E. Do we have our primary or is something majorly wrong in the primary? That's what's going to determine critical or not critical, sick or not sick, whatever, whichever one it is, and um, whether you have to, uh, excuse me, um, trans which hospital you have to transport to and in what manner. <clears throat> If again, if you're a critical patient, do this in route. Do not delay. History taking is a secondary assessment skill. Do not delay transport or primary um, assessment because of it. <clears throat> now, we have not really seen portable lactate monitors yet. However, they are coming. They will be in the field before long. So expect that. Um, I remember in 2009, I believe it was, I ran some calls with some flight crews in Pennsylvania who had lactate monitors with them, and they were doing uh, finger stick lactate, just like you would do a finger stick glucose, as part of a study to see if the lactate uh, reading and the lactate levels could accurately predict their outcome and how how um, much lactate was building up in the capillary blood and how that would affect their ultimate outcome and if it would have an impact on which facility to transport to. I've actually not seen the results of any of those types of studies yet, so I can't uh, speak to that specifically. But I do think that it is something we will see. <clears throat> And total carbon dioxide measurement is something that we have available to us. And we will be able to tell whether or not the blood is adequately, re adequately returning to the heart and if we're um, getting adequate uh, gas exchange. So remember, end tidal can both show us if the blood is returning to the lungs to be exhaled or if the gas exchange is happening as it should. So if we uh, note that we have an abnormal end tidal CO2, but everything with the lung function is normal, then we're going to go with this is a blood pressure problem. And this is a very big pro problem. We're showing really big changes in our end tidal CO2, which could mean we're not getting an end tidal. We're getting very low end tidals because the blood's not making it back to the lungs. Or it could mean we have very high end tidals, in which case there was a, was a lot of hypoxia, a lot of lack of perfusion, and we've just improved that. And now that perfusion is returning, we're sending all that CO2 back to the lungs and we're exhaling it, which would be an indication we're heading in the right direction. Anytime that we are dealing with a patient... <clears throat> Or anytime we have a critical patient or a shock patient, we need to um, try very hard. I thought that turned on the do not disturb, but apparently that didn't. Um, oh, oh, no. 
anyway, anytime that we are dealing with a uh, shock patient or critical patient like this, reassessment is vital. We have to reassess on a regular basis. So, um, one of the drawbacks of doing any type of uh, basing medical care off of military studies and military research is a large percentage of the uh, test subjects who are soldiers, uh, sailors, airmen, whichever, you know, not the point here, but a large percentage of them are young, fit, healthy individuals who compensate much better and have a much better outcomes overall. But it is worth noting that a lot of studies are not just done on the military in a certain theater, but also on civilian casualties or issues in, the, in that theater or on uh, base families, uh, children and uh, spouses and such like that. So there, there could be some in, uh, variety there. And you'd want to look at the study and say, who were your test subjects? Are we looking at a bunch of 18 to 20 year old or 22 year old men and women just out of basic training and really good physical fitness? Or are we looking at a average, uh, realistic cross section of the population? <laughs> So what are we gonna do for these patients who are in shock? We've talked about how to recognize the critical process, how to identify the, care, the condition that we're gonna treat, what is going on during shock, what types of shock we have, so on and so forth. What are we going to do? Well, oxygen is definitely a must. This is one of the times that regardless of what the, N the SPO2 reads, we wanna perfuse them with oxygen because they're having a lack of oxygen flow or this could be due to a loss of red blood cells or, or simply a decrease in perfusion. You want to maintain blood f or, um, oxygenation and per um, put as much oxygen as possible into their blood. Now, control hemorrhage, I think that that should go without saying. Um, fluids, fluid replacement. Obviously, blood replacement is the best choice possible, but that isn't always available to us, and so we may need to use volume expanders or saline and things like that. Volume expanders will often cause a shift of fluid back into the bloodstream in order to utilize third-spaced fluid and such in the body, whereas, and that could be like a hypertonic solution of some sort. Whereas a, um, but that's very, you got to be careful with that. It's not something I'm saying we're going to use on a regular basis in an ambulance because misuse of hypertonic solutions, just like a misuse of hypotonic solutions can have devastating consequences. And so most of the time we're going to volume expand through the use of um, normal saline isotonic crystalloids solutions. Keep in mind, if your patient has internal uncontrolled hemorrhage or ex uncontrolled external hemorrhage, fluid ex administration it should be limited. You don't want to cause a lot of um, increased blood pressure and increase that um, fluid, that blood loss through that hemorrhage. But um, not all shock is caused by hypovolemia, or at least not by hemorrhage, even if it is hypovolemia. It could be anaphylactic, it could be septic, uh, it could be neurogenic, in which case lots of fluid volume is needed to replace that and we are not going to increase bleeding by giving that fluid. So um, if this has caused obstructive shock, we might need to do a new, uh, needle decompression. If it's a tamponade, also it's obstructive shock. They may need pericardial synthesis. <clears throat> What can we do? We can raise their legs. Now we're not using Trendelenburg. Remember, Trendelenburg is laying the, taking a supine patient, and if this is their head, rotating their entire body so their head down, feet up in that flat plane. Right? That is not that is Trendelenburg. We will not do that because all of their abdominal contents are going to be pushing on their diaphragm. Their diaphragm has to lift those up to breathe. So that's a negative. But we can lay them supine. That's a great thing to do. And we can put them in shock position, which is to raise the legs. This causes any loose blood in the legs to flow into the core using gravity. That will be helpful. Also, due to a lack of oxygen and a lack of 
ATP, <clears throat> the muscles will not be able to produce heat. The body is not making heat. If you don't have ATP to burn, you're not going to get the, the heat as a result of it. And so the patient is at a greater risk of hypothermia. So definitely maintain that. <clears throat> What are we going to do for fluids? What are we doing for IV therapy? Well, <clears throat> make certain that you have large, uh, large bore IVs placed and you are ready for fluid replacement. If the patient is expected to need blood, the larger the needle possible. Blood can be given through a 22-gauge 22, 22 catheter. It's not ideal. You want at least a 20, but ideally an 18 or larger. 18s and 16s are really good for fluid and blood administration, but you can get away with a 20. It's better to have a 22 and have access than to blow four 18s trying to get access. <clears throat> All right. Um... Just because you might have to give fluids doesn't mean you need to start with fluids right away. They're, they may not, um, you don't need to be running fluids all the time. <coughs> Excuse me. So TKO is an appropriate option there. All right, let, uh, before we start talking about these, let's let you get up, stretch your legs real quick, take a quick break. All right, so I'm gonna finish talking about our crystalloids here and uh, or our fluids and volume expanders. So hypovolemic shock is going to be best treated with fluids. So, all right, volume expanders and plasma substitutes are types of fluids that we can give and will pull fluid back into their system. I mentioned that a minute ago, like a hypertonic solution. It pulls fluid out of the cells, out of the third space, back into the vasculature in order to maintain perfusion and build it up. Another solution is plasma substitutes. These are solutions that are isotonic in that they have a similar tonicity to plasma and they have the plasma protein carrying capacity the pro the protein process which will help with the carrying of blood and other nutrient or not blood excuse me oxygen and other nutrients and can be used to maintain perfusion well these are unique these are less common and these are very expensive products mostly because they don't have very good shelf lives they're great when they work but they all are limited in their shelf life and which makes them let far less than ideal for the pre-hospital environment so we don't normally see these types of solutions like hepstan and head of starch and uh stuff like that uh, dextran uh plasminate these are uh various examples of plasma substitutes as you can see the starch solutions that are going to have large complex carbohydrates in them something is in my eye all right so Instead of using plasma and volume expanders, we could use good old fashioned crystalloids, isotonic solutions. And we talked about these a lot more back in uh, pharmacology. So um, hopefully you're familiar with them by this time. These are solutions that have sodium and potassium or various electrolytes in them and have a very similar tonicity to the blood flow or excuse me, blood tonicity in general. Should not result in a large uh, fluid shift. However, lactated ringers and normal saline will both shift a large proportion, at least two thirds of their volume out of the capillaries into the third space and intracellular space within 20 minutes of giving it. So you've restored fluid volume, but you haven't actually restored or haven't effectively restored the volume of fluid inside their cells. You're hydrating them, but it is shifting, not their cells, inside their vessels. You've hydrated them, but you're not maintaining adequate um, volume in their vessels. And this can result in us needing to give multiple uh, fluid boluses. So with these fluid boluses, um, will come continual reassessment and things like that. A lot of departments are limiting the number of 
uh, boluses that we can do. Generally, we want to consider 20 milliliter per kilogram saline boluses or lactated ringers and should not give more than three of these boluses during care. If the patient is actively bleeding, you definitely want to limit those boluses. You do not want to give excessive quantities of fluid that will result in a um, <clears throat> um, fluid overload or a thinning of the blood that prevents the delivery of oxygen. If you also, if the patient's still actively bleeding, that's where I was going with this. If the patient's still actively bleeding, high volumes of crystalloids can increase that blood pressure and push more blood out, causing them to bleed faster, resulting in greater blood loss. In the past, there was uh, stories or people talk about giving enough fluid for the patient to bleed pink. This indicates a general thinning of their blood overall, where it is not the bright, thick, red blood that we're used to, but is starting to thin out due to the saline. This is not helpful. Saline does not carry oxygen. Um, saline is a temporary fix. Saline lactator ringers are the same. It's a temporary fix to a much bigger uh, problem. So a more effective solution is to control bleeding. And if you can't stop the internal bleeding, Obviously, it's internal. You can't stop it. But if you can't stop the bleeding, get them to a surgeon who can. They need high flow diesel to get them to bright lights and cold steel. <clears throat> now, this section is going to get into specific classifications of shock um, and treatments of cardiogenic distributive hypovolemic. hypovolemic. I want to spend a little bit more time specifically on cardiogenic and distributive because of how it plays into the respiratory and cardiac stuff that we've talked about. And so I'm going to start another video for that one. And uh, so this will be to uh, use the second link or the next video for this chapter. So, all right, see you in that video.